Welcome to the Priory Church of St Bartholomew the Great. This wonderful ancient church, almost 900 years old this year, was remodelled and restored in the 1880s, which means that it's just right, the perfect church really, in which to hold a celebration of Victorian Christmas interwoven with the works of Charles Dickens. We are incredibly lucky to have some of the great writer's descendants join us to do some readings, and just as excitingly, some of the best actors around to bring the characters and the words of Charles Dickens to life. It's been quite a dark year this year. We've all needed a bit of extra joy to keep going. And I hope that the music and the words and the prayers and the thoughts that we've put together in this service might bring a spot of Christmas joy and an extra burst of light into your Christmas this year. Dickens wrote at the end of his last published work, which is called The Life of Parliament, the following words. 
Remember, it is Christianity to do good always, even to those who do evil to us. It is Christianity to love our neighbour as ourself and to do to all men as we would have them do to us. It is Christianity to be gentle, merciful and forgiving, and to keep those qualities quiet in our own hearts, and never to make a boast of them, or of our prayers, or of our love of God, but always to show that we love him by humbly trying to do right in everything. These thoughts let us offer to God as we pray in the words that our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever.
from A Christmas Carol. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh! But he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, and on his eyebrows, and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days, and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and, and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge.
The Death of Joe from Bleak House by Charles Dickens. The cart, so hard to draw, is near its journey's end and drags over stony ground. All round the clock it labours, up the broken steps, shattered and worn. Not many times can the sun rise and behold it still upon its weary road. Joe is in a sleep or in a stupor today, and Alan Woodcourt, newly arrived, stands by him, looking down upon his wasted form. After a while, he softly seats himself upon the bedside with his face towards him, just as he sat in the law writer's room and touches his chest and his heart. The cart had very nearly given up, but labours on a little more. But, well, Joe, what, what is the matter? Don't be frightened. I thought, says Joe, who has started and is looking round, I thought I was in Tom Wall alone again. Ain't nobody here but you, Mr. Walker? Nobody. And I ain't took back to Tom all alone, am, am I, sir? No. Joe closes his eyes, muttering, Well, I'm... I'm very... I'm very thankful. After watching him closely a little while, Alan puts his mouth very near his ear and says to him in a low, distinct voice, Joe, did you ever know a prayer? Never, never know nothing, sir. Not so much as one short prayer? No, sir. Nothing, nothing at all. M M M Mr. Chadbands, he, he was a praying once to, at Mr. Sangsby's and I heard him by. He sounded as if he was speaking to himself, not, uh, not to me. He prayed a lot, but I couldn't make out nothing on it. it. Different times, there was other gentlemen come down, Tom all alone's a praying, but they all mostly said as that t'other ones prayed wrong and all mostly sounded to be talking to themselves or, or, or a passing blame on, on, on to the others and, and not, not talking to us. We, we never know nothing. I, 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 I never know what, what it was all about. It takes him a long time to say this. And few but an experienced and attentive listener could hear, or hearing understand him. After a short relapse into sleep or stupor, he makes of a sudden a strong effort to get out of bed. Stay, Joe, what, what now? And it's time for, for me to go to that there burying ground, sir. He, just, he returns with a wild look. Lie, lie down and, and tell me, what, what burying ground, Joe? Where, where they laid him as was very good, good to me. Very good to me indeed he, he was. It's, it's time for me to go down to that there burying ground, sir, and ask to be put along with him. I want to, to go, go there and be, be, be buried. He, he used to say to me, I am as poor as you today, Joe, uh, he says. I, I, want, I want to tell him that I'm as poor as him now, and I've come there to be laid along with him. By and by, Joe. By and by. Ah, perhaps that they wouldn't do it if, if I was to go myself. But will, will you promise to have me took there, sir, and, and, and laid along with him? I will indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. They'll have to get the key of the, of, of the gate before they can take me in, for it's always, always locked. And, and, and there's a step there, as I, as I used to clean with my, with my broom. Oh. Oh. It's, it's turned very dark, sir. Is there, is there any light coming? It's coming fast. Fast. The cart is shaken all to pieces and the rugged road is very near its end. Joe, my, my poor fellow. I, I, I hear you, sir, in, in, the, in the dark. But I'm a, I'm a, 
I'm a groping, I'm a groping. Let me catch hold of your hand. Joe, can you say what I say? Well, I'll say anything, because you say, so far, I knows it's good. Our Father. Ah, uh, our Father, yeah, that, 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 that's very good, sir. Which art in heaven? Uh, art in heaven. It, it, is the light a coming, sir? It's close at hand. Hallowed be thy name. Hall hallowed be thy name. The light has come upon the dark, benighted way. Dead. Dead, your majesty. Dead, my lords and gentlemen. Dead, right reverends and wrong reverends. Of every order, dead men and women born with heavenly compassion in your hearts. And dying thus around us every day. Merry, merry, 
Carol from Pickwick Papers. I care not for spring. On his fickle wing, let the blossom and buds be born. He woos them amain with his treacherous rain, and he scatters them ere the morn. An inconstant elf, he knows not himself or his own changing mind and hour. He'll smile in your face, and with wry grimace, he'll wither your youngest flower. Let the summer sun to his bright home run. He shall never be sought by me. When he's dimmed by a cloud, I could laugh aloud and care not how sulky he be. For his darling child is the madness wild that sports in fierce fever's train. And when love is too strong, it don't last long, as many have found to their pain. A mild harvest night, by the tranquil light of the modest and gentle moon, has a far sweeter sheen for me, I ween, than the broad and unblushing noon. But every leaf awakens my grief as it lieth beneath the tree. So let autumn air be never so fair, it by no means agrees with me. But my song I trow out for Christmas stout, the hearty, the true, and the bold, a bumper I drain, and with might and main give three cheers for this Christmas old. We'll usher him in with a merry din that shall gladden his joyous heart, and we'll keep him up while there's bite or sup, and in fellowship good we'll part. In his fine honest pride, he scorns to hide one jot of his hard weather scars. They're no disgrace, for there's much the same trace on the cheeks of our bravest tars. Then again I sing till the roof doth ring, and it echoes from wall to wall. To the stout old white, fair welcome tonight as the king of the seasons all.
This is from a book by Charles Dickens called The Life of Our Lord, which he wrote for his children. My dear children, I am very anxious that you should know something about the history of Jesus Christ, for everyone ought to know about him. No one ever lived who was so good, so kind, so gentle, and so sorry for all the people who did wrong or who were in any way ill or miserable as he was. And as he is now in heaven, where we hope to go, and all to meet each other after we are dead, and there be happy always together, you never can think what a good place heaven is without knowing who he was and what he did. He was born a long, long time ago, nearly 2,000 years ago, at a place called Bethlehem. His father and mother lived in a city called Nazareth, but they were forced by business to travel to Bethlehem. His father's name was Joseph, and his mother's name was Mary. And the town being very full of people, also brought there by business, there was no room for Joseph and Mary in the inn or in any house. So they went into a stable to lodge, and in this stable, Jesus Christ was born. There was no cradle or anything of that kind there. So Mary laid her pretty little boy in what is called the manger, which is the place where the horses eat out of them. And there he fell asleep.
This reading is from The Life of Our Lord by Charles Dickens. While he was asleep, some shepherds who were watching sheep in the fields saw an angel from God, all light and beautiful, come moving over the grass towards them. At first they were afraid and fell down and hid their faces, but it said, There is a child born today in the city of Bethlehem, near here, and he will teach men to love one another and not to quarrel and hurt one another and his name will be Jesus Christ. And people will put that name in their prayers because they will know God loves it and will know that they should love it too. And then the angel told the shepherds to go to that stable and look at that little child in the manger, which they did. And they kneeled down by it in its sleep and said, God bless this child. Now the great place of all that country was Jerusalem, just as London is the great place in England and at Jerusalem the king lived, whose name was King Herod. Some wise men came one day from a country a long way off in the east and said to the king, we have seen a star in the sky which teaches us to know that a child is born in Bethlehem who will live to be a man whom all people will love. When King Herod heard this, he was jealous for he was a wicked man, but he pretended not to be and said to the wise men, whereabouts is this child? And the wise men said, we don't know, but we think the star will show us. For the star has been moving on before us all the way here and is now standing still in the sky. Then Herod asked them to see if the star would show them where the child lived and ordered them if they found the child to come back to him. So they went out and the star went on over their heads a little way before them until it stopped over the house where the child was. This was very wonderful but God ordered it to be so. When the star stopped, the wise men went in and saw the child with Mary, his mother. They loved him very much and gave him some presents. Then they went away, but they did not go back to King Herod, for they thought he was jealous, though he had not said so. So they went away by night back into their own country and an angel came and told Joseph and Mary to take the child into a country called Egypt or Herod would kill him. 
So they escaped too in the night, the father, the mother and the child, and arrived there safely. Scrooge dressed himself in all his best and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards, that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far, but coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both hands. How do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness here, Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord, bless me, cried the gentleman as if his breath were taken away. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favour? My dear sir, said the other, shaking hands with him, I, I don't know what to say to such munificence. Don't say anything. Please, retorted Scrooge, come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will, cried the old gentleman, and it was clear he meant to do it. Thank you, said Scrooge. I'm much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church, and he walked about the streets, and he watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head, and questioned beggars, and looked down into the kitchens of houses, and up to the windows, and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything, could give him so much happiness. 
In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. I passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear, said Scrooge to the girl, nice girl, very... Yes, sir. Where is he, my love, said Scrooge. He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. Uh, I'll show you upstairs, if you please. Thank you. He knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. He turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in a great array. For these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points and like to see everything is right. Fred, said Scrooge, dear heart alive, how his niece by marriage started. Scrooge had forgotten for the moment about her sitting in the corner with the footstool or he wouldn't have done it on any account. Why, bless my soul, cried Fred, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I, I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. Quarter past. No Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he was trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge, I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help on a straight waistcoat. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavour to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit.
Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter, and knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes in grins as have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Amen. Thank you.